This podcast is a frank discussion on sexual assault. If you are in the USA for free and confidential help, please call 1-800-865-HOPE. If you are in Australia for confidential counseling and support in cases of sexual assault or abuse, please call 1-800-RESPECT. Stance. This is Tracy Smith. In this episode, I am joined by Damien Ryder. Damien is a multi world record breaking endurance athlete, and his extraordinary physical feats have been featured in two National Geographic documentaries. He is a global motivational speaker, mentor, coach, and the creator of One Breath Meditation. Damien is also internationally recognized for his humanitarian work creating awareness around childhood sexual abuse and has been a speaker in TED Talks in Asia Pacific and the United States. Damien is a committed ambassador for an Australian organization called the Blue Knot Foundation that dedicates its services to the support, prevention, and awareness of childhood abuse. It is his impactful work which saw Damien nominated two times for Australian of the Year. Damien's childhood is deeply scarred by years of abusive physical and sexual violence. Today, He speaks openly about how he uses extreme sports and one breath meditation to overcome trauma. Damien's story is an invigorating example of how survivors can rise up and find pathways forward through personal barriers to places of inner peace. It is my honor and privilege to welcome Damien Ryder to Open Stance. Hey, Damien. Hey, how are you going? I'm very well, thanks. How are you? Yeah, I'm fantastic. Thank you. It's a awesome. little, bit, little bit of a rainy day out here on the Gold Coast, but, uh, but yeah, it's still warm and nice. The ocean's really clean and smooth. I'm just having a look at some surfers catching some waves now. So, it's, um, yeah, it's pretty nice out there still. Have you been out yet today? I haven't been out. No, nah, I haven't actually uh, left. It's still morning for me here. And, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's raining pretty hard at the moment. And I've had, uh, had a few other calls to, to LA, actually. So in your sort of neck of the woods where you are at the moment. Uh, just yeah, That's I'm checking good. in from, I'm in Camarillo, California. It's where my brother lives, just visiting after nearly three years of being um, locked out of the U.S. I also live in Sydney, Australia, but um, uh, yeah, you were recently here. What were you doing in the U.S.? Jumping uh, so off of hot air balloons, maybe? <laughs> yeah. I, uh, well, I, I just, you know, it was time for me to, to leave Australia. I had a, a wellness retreat, a hotel that was getting sold. It was on the beach front. It was a beautiful place. I only just wanted to sell it. So it was time for me to sort of take off. And I took off to Bali for a little bit and back to Thailand. Spent a lot of time in Thailand. So back there, visited some friends and then headed over to the U.S. And I was supposed to go to the U.S. and do a book tour with all, at all the Barnes & Nobles across the U.S. But five book? Days after. One of your books. Uh, yeah, my book, One Breath Meditation. And uh, about five days after I got there, the whole world shut down. So I was kind of like, just went between there, the US and Tulum, Mexico, really. Just spent my time there. But, you know, I really utilized that time well to, so I put out the book, One Breath Meditation, but I wanted other people to really understand you know, how I came up with that, you know, I didn't just sprinkle fairy dust on myself and go, Hey, I've come up with this idea, you know? So really just went through the stages and wrote this uh, 42 lesson course out of what it actually is, you know, and how I came up with all the elements that were in there and, and how they combined and really just made this, I guess, step-by-step joining the dots together uh, journey of one breath meditation. And, you know, it's really, it's, it's more than that. It's so people can see, I say, further than the horizon and wider than their peripheral vision. You know, a lot of people get stuck complacent and in tunnel vision and just showing them the way to, to really open that up and break down those barriers and that tunnel, you know, that we sometimes look forward and we look back on the tunnel like it's that straight line. We don't look at how wide it can be you know at the bigger picture of everything and you know for me that's what uh, that's what this course was about you know it started off 
explaining, you know, what, uh, what one breath meditation is and how people can guide other people through it, not just regurgitate my words, but really own the words that they're saying that they're guiding through it, which was important for me. You know, there's a lot of people that, you know, they, they do different um, therapies, let's say meditation or breath work, but, and they're saying these words, but they have really no connection to the words. They're just, they've heard them on YouTube or whatever it is. They haven't really gone out to explore them themselves to understand. So the people that they're guiding, they don't get a great connection and sense to it because they're kind of just borrowed words. So for me, putting it out there, I really wanted to, you know, anyone who's going to guide others through the one breath meditation to really own the words and understand, you know, the words that they're saying and why they're saying it and why they're saying it in this, in this pattern and, and uh, through each of the levels as well, like why it increases and how we stretch out our comfort zone a little bit more and a little bit more. That's, that's incredible. Um, when you talk about therapies and different resources, and we're talking about dealing with trauma of many different kinds, um, and specifically childhood trauma and that kind of thing. And you, you go through therapy, and have you ever come across um, when therapists and counselors talk about um, if you were a sexual, sexual assault victim or survivor that, okay, this is something in your life you're going to have triggers and you're going to have this as part of your life for the rest of your life. Have you, have you ever come across oh, yeah. that kind of thing? Yeah, it's, it's terrible. I mean, they just, I don't that know. That was what my you, question. What do you think about that? Yeah, uh, Like, you know, and I was stuck like that for a long time, you know, probably 36 years of my life because I've, you know, gone to so many, let's say they call themselves professionals in the area. And they said exactly that, you know, the words, the common words were, um, you're going to live with this for the rest of your life and all you can do is learn to manage it. And you're learn like, to well, manage it, yeah. Give me the tools to manage it. And they kind of don't. They go, oh, yeah, you just do this and this. And it's like, all right, well, I'm doing all that, you know, for years. You know, I was doing everything that they're telling me I should be doing. And, you know, they might work for like a little bit of time, but they're not sustainable, that's for sure you know, something else will trigger you off and, and away it goes again, you know, spiraling out of control. And, you know, I tried to take my life a few times because of the words that they were, they were giving me, you know, they'd taken hope away from my life, you know, and now that I've overcome and worked it out myself, you know, I just look back and think what gives them the right to take hope yeah. away from someone, you know, that yeah. just because they haven't worked it out themselves. You know, and again, you know, that comes back to what I was saying, why it was important for me, um, for anyone who's using my method to really own the words and understand it, because these people were just regurgitating words out of a book that they learn in school or whatever, you know, that they, they probably haven't been through it themselves. And they definitely haven't come through it if they have been through something, you know, so, so they got no understanding of it whatsoever, you know, and I'd always... Even when I was in like in therapy, I would always ask them like, how do you know? Like, and did you then, always, did you always sit there? I did just wondering, have you ever been through this in your life? Do you have any idea what I'm, what I'm feeling? I, I don't know. Did you ever yeah, ask your counselors, have you ever been abused? <laughs> yeah. Like I'd give them like the benefit of the doubt for the first couple of sessions. And then I'd just start feeling them out to go like, ask them questions, you know, what's your family life like? What's this like? What's that like? And then by about fourth session, you're thinking, you got no idea what I'm talking about at all. You know, you got like, you know, your perfect marriage, you've just gone to an amazing school, your family's all together. It's all, you know, it sounds like you've had a fantastic life and fantastic upbringing, which is awesome, you know, and super happy for them to, to have that. But, you know, for them to take hope away from me from something that they have got zero understanding for, except for what they read in books. And most times in the books, they're just translated words from, you know, Russians or Germans from 50 to 70 years ago anyway, you know, so it's, they don't even have an understanding of what they're saying. They got no connection to the words. They just got like, you know, a bit of ink that are on, on a page and kind of that's it. So obviously for me, it was, it's really important to really own the words that I'm saying and, and have an understanding for them, you know? So a big thing I say to people like who say that they're gurus and therapists and this and that, I just, 
and they try to tell me different things, I just say to them, how do you know? Not how do you know, how do you know? What have you done to back up the words that you're telling me right now? Yeah. You know, what is your research? What is your experience with it? How have you overcome these things? Not just what you've read or what you've heard on, on YouTube, like what is your actual personal experience that, that, you've, that you've done with this, you know? That's, uh, it's, it's incredible because for, for someone like you that has this enormous experience, which we'll, we'll start um, highlighting for the listeners, but um, for people to have hope is such an enormous component of the healing process and to move forward and to get on and, you know, to take back your life. So how, um, since we're on one breath meditation, why don't you just, can you give us a little snapshot of what it is, how it, how it's worked for you and who it helps. Um, and just a little bit more about what it actually is and, and why you developed it. Sure. So I, um, you know, I've always worked on my breath, like all my life, you know, I've always come back to it, whether I was boxing in between rounds, whatever it might be, you know, um, I've always worked on that. So I always knew there was something there. And I hadn't done much meditation, but obviously the words had been around and thrown around a bit. And and then meditation started to come into a little bit more mainstream, let's say, you know, seven years ago. People were really into it a bit more. So I started to have a look around at people and, and I'm really good at just, I'm good at talking, but I'm really good at listening too and just gathering information and, it just seemed to be most of the people who were doing meditation were more strung out and stressed out than people who weren't. So I was kind of thinking, That's, why would I give that a go? You're more stressed than I am. You know, I'm all right. And then, but I'll still listen to it. And there were some good parts out of it as well. And, but one of the main things was, it was like a vice for everyone, you know, they needed their certain map to sit down a certain time of day to sit there for 10 minutes to li listen to their certain Tibetan bells and everything was exactly the same, but it, it had boundaries to it and it wasn't there when they need it, you know, and for me, I live like a fast paced life, like most people sort of do. And, you know, I do these extreme challenges all over the world. And sometimes, you know, they're, they're going to make life and death decisions right there and then, you know, do I paddle? Do I let the shark eat me? Do I, what do I do? You know, and I've got to keep calm at that same time. So, you know, let's say like when I did my paddle, you know, I had sharks, great whites circling me, you know, I couldn't just call time out and go, man, I'm just going to grab my favorite mat. I'm going to sit on the beach for 10 minutes. And then I'll come back out because I'll be calm then. I've got no time to do that. So I had to like intuitively just recall every time that I've kept myself calm in different situations out of my life and really break that down to what it actually is for me to be able to have a connection to it in one breath to be able to keep moving forward. Now, essentially, all it is is just breathing through the nose, holding the belly for two, and breathe out through your mouth as slowly as you can. That's the one breath meditation. And it's easy enough to say, and it's easy enough to do, but it's different to have an actual connection to it, to understand what it is. <clears throat> the reason as well why, why it's so effective is because there are three conscious decisions that you have to make. One is to draw in through your nose, like with intent. Second is to hold in your belly for two, one, two and the third is to breathe out slowly as you can through your mouth as long and slow as you can now because there are three conscious decisions you have to make everything else around you and inside your head has to take a break while you do that because you can't be over overloading your mind with everything else that's going on and do that at the same time you know to be connected to it knowing what your purpose needs to be for it. And a lot of the times that's all we need. We just need that little bit of time out, little step back just for a second. I have another look at what's actually going on in front of us and to be able to keep moving forward. So if we're calm on the inside, we're calm on the outside. 
you know. So you don't need to sit down for 20 minutes. And I'm not taking anything away from, from that. You know, people have, you know, changed their lives and everything from it. So I'm not taking anything away from it at all. All I felt was that it just hadn't evolved. You know, meditation, breath work, yoga just hadn't evolved. And it's not results driven. So I'll come from a fitness background where everything's results driven. We do what we can to get fitter, faster, stronger. We know where we're aiming towards, you know, the pin load, you put your pin down, you know, you're working towards something. It just seemed to me that, you know, breath work, meditation, even yoga as well, was kind of like reading the same page of a book every time you do it and you're going to get better at reading it and you're going to understand it more, but you're not progressing enough unless you do it yourself. Like the, the teacher's job isn't to progress you along. They're just there to run the class and do the same thing. And it's up to you as the individual to progress yourself along with it of where you want to go with it or try a new discipline of yoga, let's say, or become an instructor or do more hours or whatever it is, but it's up to the individual to do that. So it's not really guided in a results driven way. So, and on, and for trauma, obviously, you know, you go through trauma, you need to keep moving forward. But, and the problem is that you get stuck, you know, you get stationary with it, you know, like three pillars of connection separate, you know, connection to yourself, connection to your breath and connection, knowing that we keep moving forward, you know, there's a separation, either one, two or three parts of it separate. And then that's why people always say, Oh, I lost my breath in that moment. Oh, I can't get past it. I'm, I'm stuck in the past. I get stuck in it because I have, I feel that they have that separation of those three simple things that we all need. That's our roots and foundation of every single person's existence in life. We need to breathe. We need to have a connection with ourselves, and we keep moving forward. As long as the sun rises and sun sets, whether you believe that, you know, time's irrelevant or whatever there's still sunrises and sunsets and we get old that means we're moving forward you know so yeah. everything else comes from there if you say to people what's important in your life they might say happiness family love kids that's awesome but if you're not breathing and you don't have a connection with yourself you don't have any of those anyway yeah did you um when you were on that first event paddling from Kulangata to bondi um, you didn't have one breath meditation at that time, did you? No, no. I mean, I was I was doing it intuitively, but I hadn't created it at all. You know, it's and, a um, from from reading your story, and and we're just meeting for the first time today. But I've read a lot about that journey that you took from Kulangata to uh, Bondi, January third, twenty fifteen. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. That is. Um, there's a part of that journey that just stands out to me the most. And I want to just ask you about it. There's, you don't have one breath meditation. You're out there for the first time and you've had a turning point in your life, which has just thrown you into this, this new extraordinary feat that you're tackling, but out there somewhere, um, I read words like purging transformation. Um, I, you said, I almost wanted to quit. So that, that piece of the story hits me every time. What happened out there, Damien, because you didn't have this other stuff and that word purging for people that are going through trauma that are stuck. And we're not just stuck, we're in the shit. It's tough times. It seemed like you were in that out there is what was happening and how did you move through that? Yeah, I mean, yeah, day five, yeah, day five changed my life forever. You so know, what was, happened on day four? <laughs> so, like, I, I was pretty much where I live now, and I've just, you know, I, I walked down to my local beach. Obviously, I trained up for eight months beforehand. I um, was going to set myself this challenge, and, you know, even though it wasn't a suicide mi mission, I was just, I was willing to die for what I believed in to, to get it out there. And, you know, I'd really taken my life back into my own hands and stop listening to other people of what I should be doing to heal and really just going back to my intuitive way of, of what I know. And that mean that meant putting some people, even close friends, just at arm's length away, 
you know, just to really focus on what I need to do and what I wanted to achieve, you know, for the first time really in, in my life and then not have any influence from anyone else and just do it all my way. And then if I was wrong, then I was wrong, you know, but it was me, you know, but I was just going to make sure that, you know, I was going to use all the tools that I've learned along the way through all my challenges to, um, to do something that, uh, that I knew I was going to be proud of, you know, and be able to raise awareness. So <clears throat> as you said, January 3rd, 2015, walked down to my local beach, plonked my paddleboard in the, in the water, 18 foot long by 20 inches wide. I'd only started paddleboarding, you know, that eight months beforehand, not a paddleboarder at all, surfer, but not paddleboarder, different sort of sport. And I started paddling, you know, and as soon as I started paddling out, there's like huge storms and everything like straight away. Like it wasn't like a cruisy ride at all, but you know, there was so much pain that was going on. You know, I was paddling for 13, 15 hours a day, every single day. And there's no one out there with me and there's no communication. There's no, you know, Facebook, no distractions, no anything like that at all. Um, no boat support, no land, land support, no one telling me to keep on going. It wasn't a race. It wasn't anything like that. It was just me and my determination to, to go and do something that, that I'd never done before. And to raise awareness along the way of, of child abuse. And then, uh, yeah, so I was paddling along and, you know, I started facing tough, tough times pretty much straight away. And then by the, by the second day, you know, I got pitched from this big wave and I lost all my supplies and I'd come in and pretty much I swept up on the beach and I was like, shit, like, is this too much for me? Like, I'm not even a paddleboarder, what am I doing, you know? <laughs> and all these other professionals who paddle Molokai every year, going, it's impossible. If, if it was possible, someone we knew, we know would have done it. And I'm like, well, it doesn't mean it's impossible. It just means that I was working out, I guess. So I just kept on going. Then day three, you know, I had like all these shark encounters circling me, knocking me off my board. I was knocked unconscious from the board hitting me. I was dragged underwater for about a quarter mile, two times, like in about half an hour, come to, paddle back out, hit by another wave back in again, paddle back out, circle by another 15 foot great white shark and um, tail whip me, flick my, my board off. I'd have to get right. in the water and watch him swim around. Like, well, I had to adjust my fin and climb back on while it's circling. And, you know, so all this shit's going on. I'm like, Jesus Christ, I'm only in day three. You know, I've got like two weeks to go of this. Like how much can I deal with, you know? But, you know, I just had to start just calming myself down and, and one of the big things was I couldn't think about what just happened because something else was happening like in a few minutes time whether it was sharks or jellyfish or, or whatever it was but it wasn't just bad things it was good things as well you know you know pots of dolphins cruising by me or just looking at bits of you know land or like on the beach thinking like there's probably only a handful of people in the world who have seen that spot and definitely not this slow on a paddleboard, you know, <laughs> going two mile an hour or something. So I was just like, you know, so so much emotion that was going on. But one of the big things was, you know, there was no escaping my internal emotions from my past and the visuals and everything that were coming in. And it was like where I started to have pain in my body was triggering off pain that was happening as as a child not just emotional pain but physical pain you know like where i'd been thrown on the floor or against the wall or whatever it was you know they started really triggering off on me and then just people's voices you know throughout my life as well just you know the goods and bads but also you know bad things i've done to other people as well like a, as a result of just acting out playing up not a, not having any emotional intelligence for my emotions at all you know just letting them go wild from me and hurting myself and hurting other people along the way so there was a lot that I was, I was dealing with plus the pain plus keep on paddling and try to work out when I'm supposed to eat and have some water and yeah. everything as well you know because I was on I was on uh, real tight rations on the board and uh, just keep going. So, you know, and then I was stung by this jellyfish and I was like, it was super bad for me and uh, pretty much paralyzed from waist down and headaches and everything from it. And yeah, just all like voices and everything from my head really bad. And, and I was coming into, in the Coffs Harbour 
And I just thought, shit, like, is this too much for me? Is that as far as I could go? And, and I thought, you know, if, if I stop now, everyone's still going to go, hey, look, you, you know, you did an awesome job. You know, you've just paddled for like five days. Like, it's, it's incredible the feet. And I was thinking, yeah, like, it's pretty good. Like, I still don't know anyone else who's paddled that far. So I've probably still broken a few records. I haven't quite got, you know, the, the media exposure that, that I would have hoped towards the cause. And I was like, right, well, I'll just, uh, I'll go in and I'll have a sleep. And let me process what's actually gone on over these last few days. And that was the first time I'd really stopped and thought about like, most of the time I didn't think about what, like I said, like what had happened the day before or minutes before, you know, I just kept going ahead, just kept aiming for that headland ahead and just kept aiming for that. And that, that was my goal, you know, just reach certain little spots along the way. And then, so I went to sleep and then I woke up in the morning and it was like this overcast day. There was no wind or anything. And, you know, it's just an incredible day on, on the water. But one thing was I had no emotional connection to my past at all. It was kind of like a, it had all gone and like all the little demons had, had left me, you know, that had just weighed me down and clawed yeah. at me for all of my life. You know, they're kind of just gone. And I'm going to put the board in the water and started, I knew it was going to be a long paddle that I had to do. And I was about five minutes into it and, and again, another 15 foot white pointer came past me and he was probably, I don't know, eight to 10 foot away from me. And I literally just said, g'day, mate, and just kept on paddling, didn't even stop, you know, just kept on going. And it wasn't until like about an hour later, I was like, wow, I handled that a little bit different than the days before. And I just had like, had a long day, but just had a, a, an absolutely incredible day where I had no pain or anything. There was no elements going against me. It was just like the water was like an oil slick the whole way, just so smooth and glassy for the whole 15 hours I was going it wasn't sunny or anything it was just just such an incredible day and there was like a moment where like all these dolphins were just with me for about an hour just like slowly cruising along with me as, as I paddled along and Amazing. saw some guys surfing on this little secret break that they'd got to and they kind of like, stopped for a bit and had a chat with them and like how'd you get here I said oh, I just paddled from the dolphins and they're like holy shit we thought we'll do all right coming through the bushes to get here <laughs> so, crazy dude so, yes yeah, a... so, um, it just changed everything and really changed you know my outlook on everything and really gave me um gratitude for everything that i'd gone through in my life to get to that that point then so that that brings me to um such so you're literally purging so much there and this is we go to something where we're talking about um pain barriers and when you're dealing with sexual assault trauma um and trauma of any nature for that matter when you start to deal with it if you get to that place and you're feeling um safe and or not safe in your case <laughs> When you get to those pain barriers, what, what is the message that you can share from your experience that it is so hard when that stuff comes up emotionally and physically and mentally that it's, it's just so hard for so many people and torturous. So that you've been through it and risen above so much. What, what is it that you can share with people that actually are at that point and reaching those boundaries and jumping out of their comfort zones um, and, and tapping on that next stage, knowing that they want to go there, but God dang, it's hard right now and maybe too hard. Um, what, what can you share about your experience and how that would translate to someone else's journey that may help them through that, that moment or that stage? Well, for me, you know, looking back, it was just once I'd got to that point, I'd put blocks up, you know, I'd stopped it instead of allowing it to go through. And the more you stop it, obviously, it's just, you're always just going to get to that point, you know? So it, it's kind of like, like anything, you know, like you can run to a point where you saw, or you can keep on running past and keep on going, you know? And then you realize, oh, no, uh, you know, I've ran an extra five miles and I actually thought I could. It's the same thing with your emotions, you know? 
just being able to understand it and push through it a little bit more and each time, you know, just hang on to it a little bit more. But it's about being, um, about understanding your emotions as well. You know, in, in today's society, it's, it's bad because we get told we got to be happy all the time. If you're not happy, you're depressed. If you're depressed, you better check yourself out. You know, we're not given the option to explore our emotions. And, and same as like when we're growing up as kids, I think it's something that should be taught in school more to express and feel your emotions and have an understanding of it and don't be scared of them, you know? If you're happy, be allowed, be happy, be sad, be allowed yeah. to have them. Be allowed to, yeah. Don't be suppressed. And it's what happens, you know, and it's just, it's no fault of, you know, our carers, parents, whoever they may be, but, you know, stop crying, don't do this, don't do that, you should do this, be happy all the time, blah, 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 it gets drilled into our head. So naturally that's how we think we should be, you know, but everyone loses, um, loses sight of the control of their emotions because we just don't explore them enough at all. You know, we just think we have to be a certain way or we, we paint a picture in our head of, of how we want the world to see us instead yeah. of just being, being real with our emotions of, of who we are, you know? And then that's the way that you have, let's say, you know, more control of them because you're exploring them more, you're pushing them, you're understanding them, you're processing what it actually is. But when we're not doing that, the tendency, which is very typical when you're not allowed to, have emotion or grieve or be angry and, and everything under the sun. Um, the typical response is going to the incredibly dangerous and unhealthy coping mechanisms that so many trauma survivors experience, if not all of us. <laughs> or in, and, and it's something that I really want to tap into here because it's something else that I've read about um, in some of your stories and, and listened to in your speeches is how you had a whole raft of really dangerous, unhealthy behaviors going on in your life um, before you had your turning point, which just picked you up and you said, that's it, I'm going that way. Um, but what part of that, so I think it's really important from an educational point of view to just highlight what those red flags are because we don't have emotions. So we start having addictions and we have the unhealthy behaviors. What are they, the red flags? And in many cases, these coping mechanisms, um, a trauma survivor or sexual abuse survivor hasn't even admitted or still in denial about their own abuse. So um, maybe highlight what they are so we can be recognizing from the outside in. And um, at what stage did you associate these behaviors with your own trauma or did you? Yeah, I mean, I didn't understand it for a long time. You know, I just knew I was spiraling out of control every now and then. And, and you know, the good life wasn't a good life for me, it seemed to be. You know, um, whenever I would get up and, and have good things happen in my life, uh, it was kind of almost like I felt like I didn't deserve it. So I would just destroy it. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm on the change, you know, it, it took a long time. And, you know, the first step was really just knowing I needed to make a change. You know, that's having a real good look at my life. And even though I was successful in what I was doing, there's, there needed to be some changes in it. So, you know, for me, that was definitely the first step. And then, and then how do I do it? What does that look like? You know, and then that's, again, you know, seeing therapists and trying to talk things through and, you know, getting what I can out of different situations and seeing what actually works for me with, through everything, you know, and really just starting to, to process everything and having a good look around it of why are other people seem to be genuinely happy when I'm not and we both seem to be doing the same thing, you know? So really it was about looking, looking outwards more so and what I wanted out of my life, you know, who I wanted to be, not to the, other, not to the rest of the world, but to myself, you know, who did I want to be? You know, what changes did I want to make? And just really start thinking about what I've learned along the way that I might have put aside and thought, oh, it would, you know, just because I was able to put, you know, bicycles together as a kid, you know, that I'm not going to do that now. What, you know, what did I get out of it? But understanding that everything matters of what you do and everything's a tool that leads 
from one step to another and and just really start having that um, connection with myself and trusting my intuition more and and the person who I am and not being like everyone else and not doing it just because I do things different to other people, you know, that's, that's who I am and I should be happy with that. But yeah. I mean, there's definitely trigger points along the way, you know, it's obviously the, the normal ones like the excessive drinking and, and drugs and um, womanizing and all those sorts of things, you know, that excessive um, addictions in, in whatever that looks like, you know, but just understanding why I go to that, why I go to them and what I'm actually getting out of it, what it actually is that I'm, that I'm looking for, for it. You know, um, a lot of people, and I start again, you know, I start looking around at other people and, you know, they're sort of, they're just normal, casual people, but when they start drinking, then they're like the life of the party and they're crazy and this and that. And so I started thinking, oh, I was kind of like that as well. I was always outspoken, but, you know, drinking, I'd be like the wild one for sure. But I just come to a point, I thought, what if I test myself and why do I need to put artificial substances in me to get to that point? If I like to be like that anyway, wild and talk to everyone and, and happy and, you know, at the bar talking with everyone, why can't I just be that normally anyway? Because that's just me. It's just chemically enhanced. So why can't I just do it myself? So I kind of just tested out things that way. You know, I thought, oh, I can just do it without having those things. So I guess that was one of the bigger changes in my life. And then from there, it was just, you know, it still went up and down, up and down. But I really started setting myself that goal forward of, of who I wanted to be. And I knew it was going to take time. You know, I had to look at other things I'd done in my life. And, you know, we all want things to happen very quickly. You know, whether it's business, relationships, money, mm change, healing, health, overcoming trauma, whatever it is, we want it now. You know, we want that magic pill, but there is no magic pill. You no. know, it takes time. Things take time, you know, but it's just about staying with it and, and trusting yourself. You know, they say trust the journey, but, you know, it is trust the journey, but it's also driving the journey. You know, you yeah. really got, you can't be the passenger in it. You know, you've got to, you've got to be the driver of your own journey and you've got to make your own pathway and you've got to make things happen. You know, again, people say that everything happens for a reason and, you know, when one door closes, another one opens and there's all these different sayings, but it's, it's you who make that happen. You know, and I love not, um, that leads you. Life life says, hey, yeah. You know, yeah, that was struggle, but you got to be over here. Life wants you over here. It's like, no, no, no. Well, no. I'm pushing stuff over here. I'm learning from it. And instead of just blowing it off and going, oh, life had other had another way for me to do something it's about all right what did i actually do and subconsciously process what happens to enhance my life and what did i learn out of it to make this path a little bit easier than i'm now on and one of the things you talk about a lot which i really resonates for me is this the concept of connection and, and you you speak so fluently about connection and in, in the transformations that happen around that. But the thing that really hit me was when you speak about disconnecting, and I, this is the first time I've ever heard anybody talk about it, but I find for people that have gone through to the other side, so to speak, there's been a disconnection in, in what you, you can talk about it. Um, you disconnected from your people, your friends, um, your world in order to re-enter re -enter the world basically in a new connection with a new relationship to the world or the, the world's relationship to you, um, however you see it. But can you talk about that please? Because I think that is one of the most powerful forces for individuals to understand that that's, that disconnection is a positive word. And that is something that is so key to us finding who we are and what our truth and our purpose is because every one of us is individual and you, you have such an awesome journey that you speak about um, that disconnection that you had in your life for a long period before you get to your life as you know it today. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, it's a big part, you know, I say to people, you got to disconnect to reconnect, 
you know, and really that's what meditation is. You know, you disconnect from what's going on with the monkey mind in front of you or yeah. what's happening in front of your eyes to reconnect back with yourself, you know, and again, you know, that's what, that's the, that's what one breath meditation is in, in simple, simplized version of it, you know, disconnect from here, reconnect with yourself, keep moving forward, you know? So yeah, I mean, it's, it's about disconnecting from the emotional attachment that you have with your past. You know, it's not about blocking your past and putting it aside. You know, you can never change what happened in the past. I can never go back and, and, and change it, you know, at all. And I can either beat myself up about it or blame myself for it or feel, you know, feel guilty about it or feel, um, you know, all sorts of negative emotions about what happened to me of something that wasn't my fault, let's say. Um, but I can never change it either. So you can either have it play with you for the rest of your life, or you can learn to disconnect from it and take lessons and tools from it that you learn. And we all, you know, whether we have good or bad situations in our life, you know, there's always lessons, really good lessons for us to learn going forward, you know, and lessons are how resilient we are. You know, if we're still here and we're still cracking on, we're resilient, aren't we? You know, so even when I jumped in the water like for the paddle, I knew like there was probably a good chance that I wasn't going to make it alive. But at the same time, I was like, look what I've overcome. All I'm doing is paddling from point A to point B. Sure, there's going to be sharks along the way. It's the ocean. It's like, you know, it'd be like more weird if I didn't see any. You know, so it was kind of like, you know, if I can overcome what happened to me as a child, surely I can overcome this. You know, and I can just, just paddle forward this should be nothing to me you know this is just a physical feat but obviously you know it changed my life more so you know <laughs> sort of yeah. dramatic ones out there but i was able to to again you know just change those and again you know it's just about processing everything that happens in life and about testing it and challenging yourself daily as we all do you know we, we put tests in front of us all day whether it's you know should we have a triple shot latte today or just a regular double shot should we you know like you know there's always a little test that we do should we walk down to the traffic lights or are we lot right just running across the road here am i okay driving on the wrong side of the road or on the wrong side of the car <laughs> or am i not you know so we all have like these tests and challenges but it's about understanding and processing and and, and having a good time with them and then that way when the bigger challenges come up like life challenges come up well we're already kind of up there. We're already ready, you know. We're already in that process of, you know, overcoming different challenges and having yeah. a good time with them. And then the, let's say the smaller ones that that come along, kind of just drop away and they're just they're nothing, you know. We just uh, we just bypass those. How was um, how was your meditation at the top of that hot air balloon at seventy five hundred feet? I tell you, that's probably one of the most incredible things I, I've done. You know. Um, you know, that whole, that whole thing of, of, you know, I picked an event, I wanted to, you know, jump off the top of a hot air balloon. Um, and, you know, I always walk, work backwards from it. So firstly, you know, I was like, all right, what message you want to set on my next challenge? And I'm like, okay, so the message is going to be um, reach new heights. And I thought, what better way to reach new heights than go up and then jump off top of a hot air balloon. I think that would be cool. Sweet. So I was like, all right, what do, I, what do I need to do? All right, I better learn to skydive first. <laughs> so I'd pick the event, I'd pick the message, then the event, and then what do I need to do to, make, to get it done? You know, so I learned to skydive and, and everything. I went out to Arizona and uh, to skydive Arizona and, and got my licenses that I need to, needed to do for it. Found the balloon guy and, um, yeah, went up there and there was so much chaos that was going on on the ground. Like there was camera crew and everyone and there was like, you know, ropes that weren't getting tight that should be. And I was obviously on top of the balloon. I couldn't get it myself. And it was, it was a little bit frustrating at, at the start, you know, and people were kind of there to, to help make sure everything was as safe as possible before we took off. But at the same time, they were like, wow, there's a guy on top of a balloon, you know? Because you're not, you're not going up in the carriage. You're going up as the balloon's top. expanding. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I started on the ground, and as it inflates, you know, I just hung onto the top until I was there. Then I was able to stand up on top. 
And, uh, you know, so it was a bit of chaos that was sort of going on. And then next thing I knew, I was like, like fixing one of the ropes up top. And I looked down and I was already like 500 foot off the ground. I was like, oh, right, I guess that's, this is what I've got to work with, you know. It doesn't look very safe to me of, of what we'd planned, but we're away now. I'm not going to tell them to drop it down. So in that moment, you know, I just stopped, you know. I looked at the sunrise and just got this feeling of gratitude all over me of this is incredible. Like, like I really live like moving forward a, a lot, but at that moment and, and some moments in my challenges, I'm really just in the moment, like absolutely completely. And there I've just felt so much gratitude to be able to be sitting on top of a hot air balloon, rising up, you know, to seven and a half thousand feet, just watching the sunrise and with no one else around, but also knowing that you know, I'm the only person in the world who's ever done that. You know, people have been up on top of a hot air balloon, but no one like has, you know, meditated doing some breath work on top as they watch the sun rise. You know, it's um, everyone started later on in the day. So, I mean, it's an incredible feeling of that and not just to be the first, but, you know, to be grateful for everything that I'd gone through in my life to be able to put myself in that position to experience that, you know? And again, it comes back to having, you know, being grateful for all of the struggles in my life. You know, had I not had all those struggles, I probably wouldn't have experienced that at all, you know? That's, so, was, um, yeah, I mean, that's it was incredible. super powerful. So when you're talking to, again, um, in one of your TEDx speeches and, you, you talk about how everybody in the audience isn't probably going to go paddle 500 miles and jump off a top, uh, the top of a hot air balloon, which is true, right? So there's still a lot of trauma survivors out there that are looking for that pathway through. And um, your story is, it's so powerful for, for me to listen to you right now, to hear what you're feeling up there, because what I'm hearing is a freedom and it's just utter peace that is indescribable. Um, and for so what I'm getting to here is when you go through those pain barriers and you've had 40 odd years of that, getting to that point, there's this enormous sense of freedom um, and gratitude that you're experiencing in such extreme situations. But to be able to relate that to other people in their daily lives and however they take one step in front of the other and push through those pain barriers, that feeling is going to be there for them as well. And it doesn't, you can, you can say in your words how that is because they're not going to all jump off a hot air balloon, but that feeling of self-accomplishment and self-pride and self-love and self-peace that you come to is what is on the other side of that hard work and those pain barriers that you're um, creating awareness around and, and, and coaching people to keep moving forward because that's what's on the other side in so many cases. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, that's why I do all my events, you know, it's uh, show people what's possible, you know, and yeah, like you said, like I don't say to people, you, oh, you need to paddle 500 miles or skateboard across countries or jump off balloons or whatever it is. Like I do that because I can and I'm able to. And that's why I, I've chosen to do it. But it's also to the extreme, you know. So a lot of people live vicariously through my events and they may never do what, what I do and may look at them as crazy. But it also takes excuses out of their lives as well to uh, for them just to get started to walk around the block to go for a run to do whatever it is you know or, or start baking yeah. you know cakes or, or whatever whatever it is that they ever want to do but you know it really just you know creates possibilities like endless possibilities for people you know there is no limits on, on people's lives and like i said nothing's impossible someone just hasn't worked out how to do it yet that's all sure. you know what i mean people put that that impossible feeling of doubt in their mind just because they haven't worked out how to do it themselves yet yeah. and that's it so it's about going to explore it so say to people that there's 
there's no such thing as fail. People go, oh, I failed, I failed at this. There's no such thing as fail. It's only learning. You know, that's that's all that happens is you just learn. And people say, oh, I had to go on the run. Oh, I failed the run. I didn't have to well, you just learned what you need to do next time. That's kind of all there is, you know. And there's, as you said, there's no impossible. Everything's possible. And yeah. we keep on keep on going forward, you know. So, yeah, I mean, testing and challenging yourself is is a good thing, and every uh, you know, it's definitely something that um, everyone should do. And I, I recommend to anyone who's facing any sort of trauma, past trauma, or can't, can't get past something. But it's not about it's not about pushing yourself with something that you know how to do. Just doing it more. It's about learning new activities you know because then you start firing off your brain again in different ways you need to learn adapt accept to keep going this is actually a really good segue into um your your role as an ambassador for a wonderful organization in australia called the blue knot foundation and again it's a real um, highlight of your whole message, keep moving forward one step at a time. And we've seen you come through um, what has been really horrific childhood trauma into taking that and just transforming it into a completely new life and new connection with the world and, and everything extraordinary that you're doing now for yourself and to take your experience and to share it with the world to, to help everybody who needs it and just to offer support and prevention um, on so many levels. And then to see how that's evolved into one breath meditation, um, which you've created, um, it's just phenomenal and I'm sure so useful. I'm gonna look into that myself. And now here you are, um, you have a recent role with this organization. Can you tell us a bit about who they are, where they are, and what you do and, and maybe any upcoming events um, that we can support and be part of. Yeah, sure. So obviously, you know, through, through what I do, I get hit up a lot by different organizations wanting me to align with them or be an ambassador or a champion or whatever it is for them. And I'm really selective about it. Like um, even from the start, like I started my own unofficial sort of foundation which i didn't raise money for it was called paddle against child abuse and obviously we come from the first paddle and i just thought look i'll just do it myself and then i, I got a bit more control over it you know i'm one risking myself and you know i wanted to also just to be about the message rather than about how much money i was raising basically just just until i worked everything out you know i just had like a different purpose to it to what i was doing but um, I have been part of like a couple of great organizations, um, like Child Safe, that do some pretty cool things. But when I was in, uh, in Memphis, I was, you know, I knew I wanted to do this, this event and started sort of looking around again. And, and even doesn't matter where I am in the world, I always try to help people back home in Australia. So, you know, I, Blue Knot Foundation had, had crossed my path a couple of times. And I looked into them for what they were doing. And then I started really looking into what they were doing. And I got on, had a couple of Zoom calls with them. I was watching their videos and everything. And, and something really sparked off with me of, you know, the president saying, 100% you can heal from trauma. And you don't have to live with, you know, the, the emotional attachments of your past. And I was like, Eureka, finally, there's someone else out there who thinks this. And this, this is, is Dr. What? Kathy Kesselman, correct? That's right. Yeah. So yeah, we got on. I mean, the woman, she she should be Australian of the year. Just just insane and giving hope to, to these people, you know, like it's incredible, you know, and what she's come through herself and what she's created, like, you know, I went down the athletic path. She path. She went down the, the clinical side of things, and you know, and I was just like, wow. I mean, everyone needs to know about this organisation. You know, like they do so much good, but behind the scenes, and it's because, like I said, they've gone down that clinical path, and they do everything that I think charity should do, which is make a difference and be results driven in making a difference. You know, that's what you get your funding for. 
for other people, not just so you can promote your brand and do some good, do some good marketing, you know, that's, that's not what it's about. Or just raising awareness for problems that everyone knows is a problem. Let's find solutions to the problems, you know. Let's not just cash in on other people's misfortunes. So, uh, yeah, so we had some good talks and then I did my balloon jump for him as an ambassador and just had a really good relationship with him. It's really open and, and it's real. You know, no one's hiding anything at all. And it was good. And I just thought, look, you know, I, more people need to know about this organization and the tools and the workshops and everything that you do and the support that you have, not just for survivors, but for the carers as well and the support workers for it. And especially now because COVID lockdowns, everything, you know, normal people have become more support workers for other people as well. You know, obviously they can't go to the therapist or this or that and, or other people's traumas starting to rear its ugly head more because they are in lockdown, stuck in their house, you know. There's not really any vices outside of the house and once they've sort of exhausted those and then obviously the emotional past comes through and whoever's around has to become that, that therapist to yeah. them who aren't equipped, you know, they don't have the tools to deal with it themselves, you know. And I know myself, you know, even when I started on this journey seven, eight years ago, you know, the amount of people that were reaching out to me, and I'm not a counsellor or anything, you know, but I would try and give them the tools and I'd give them, you know, different ways to learn and different perspective on life. But, you know, it was a lot, like it was a lot for me. We're talking thousands of people every week contacting me about their, their darkest secrets that they've never told anyone. And, you know, even though I had no emotional attachment to, to my past that I could deal with this, it was still a lot, you know, sure. there's a lot to, to overload me with. So I had to make some changes of how I presented myself to the world, you know, and, and what sort of uh, comments and audience and what sort of dialogue would come back at me, you know, when I wanted it. And, uh, but yeah, other people don't, I think it's great at the start that they're helping others, but then they realize this, this is burning me out big time. You know, a lot of support workers, They've only got like a, a one year shelf life and it's, it's too much for them. They've overloaded. And a lot of these people are dealing with things themselves that they haven't overcome. And they're, you know, getting bombarded by other people's, you know, emotions, which uh, most times are triggering in themselves as well for their own. Yeah. So they're just putting up these blocks. So, you know, it was um, refreshing to find uh, Blue Knot Foundation, as I said, you know, like I've had so many organizations all over the world wanting to align with me and I really do my research into them. And, you know, so to hear that there was hope for it, it was fantastic, you know. And, you know, I help, still help, you know, hundreds of people, you know, around the world every year. But I looked at it in, in a way with, these, with this organization, with Blue Knot Foundation, that I can help thousands, millions of people now. You know, they got a team of, of experts who their message and everything aligns with mine. Much you know, better that scope. Of, yeah, that you can heal from it. And these are the tools and here's the workshop that you can do it. Here it is, you know. So now, you know, I help more people by being able to direct them to a path and a source and platform where I know they will get the right healing and guidance from sure. you know like you know i've researched and i've done everything you know i'm confident to pass people to blue knot foundation and i was so confident that i you know it was kind of my decision to start to come back to australia and we started just having these discussions of, of me coming on as like a more permanent role and and being able to reach out to a new audience that may not be aware of them you know, let's say on the sports side, the lifestyle side, the ocean side, you know, stepping away from the clinical side and allow them to do that and allow them to make all their changes and to create, you know, the first child abuse centre in Australia, which they've just recently done, you know, to have it accessible to everyone else, just let them know. And through the events that I do, but also through a combination of events. So, so I'm now, you know, I'm honoured to be, on their team as their fundraising and events manager for Australia. So I get to, you know, create some amazing events that we put on and that we're a part of as well. So we're now just teaming up with some other people and, and using our resources to help them. So then they're able to do what they do and 
we run the campaigns and have the PR support around them. So everyone has their job role to make the greatest impact. And the, the good part about it is, is I've been on both sides of all sides of it, really. Yeah. You know, I've come from trauma. I've ran my own events. Um, I know what works with media and everything as well. So, and I know the support that I would have loved doing my events to create a bigger impact for other people, you know? So a lot of people do events and they jump from one organization to another organization or do an event and just attach a cause to it. You know, no, they're going to get a bit more um, airtime with it by doing it. But my, my aim is to have, you know, these events people, that people put on and ambassadors all around Australia, they just stay with Blue Knot because they trust it. And you know, so they trust what I'm saying and trust, um, you know, the, the workshop to be able to go, look, okay, yeah, our event's going to, like I was, our event's going to help hundreds of people. But if I align with these guys, I'm helping thousands and millions that I could never in the first place. Absolutely. And so what's the... Um what's the next event coming up? Do you have anything planned or scheduled? I know COVID's kind of running rampant in Australia still, but. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I don't, I haven't, that's never really worried me. You know, my goal is a bit bigger than, than COVID. You know, there's always ways around it. And I just, you know, there's just. <laughs> it, there is in America. Obstacles. I just went to a Lakers game last night. I'm like, there's 350 yeah. million people in this country with COVID everywhere. And we're at a Lakers game. I'm like, Kids got a COVID yeah. test two minutes before the game. No problem. <laughs> They're in. Yeah. I mean, you, you keep on going on. As long as your goal is bigger than, than what's happening in front of you, there's always going to be obstacles along the way, you know. But uh, look, I've got like another record jump balloon type thing, you know, pushing the extreme just that little bit more and a bit more hair raising, which will be fun also. But for uh, Blue Knot, we're organising this day on the 6th of March. It's called Into the Blue and we're booking out uh, Southport Aquatic Center and it's going to be everything to do with, with water. And Where is uh, that? Where is Southport that? Aquatic Center on the Gold Coast. So okay. that's where the main, main part of it will be and we'll have ambassadors doing events on that same day all around Australia to do with water or blue or ocean or sky or something like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's going to be a fun day. It's family day. It's going to be free dive competitions. It's going to be people walking underwater, carrying rocks. Awesome. Um, tie dive competitions, there's synchronized swimming. There's uh, learn to swim for uh, disabled kids. There's, I mean, fun, full of events. But again, you know, it's all about that trauma informed activities. You know, we've got some fantastic speakers that are coming there on, on the day. And Kathy's obviously, she's going to be talking as well and sharing the message out there. And, you know, it's just really about opening up to a new audience, but also current audience being able to try new things, you know, being able to get out there and they might swim, but they may not have tried free diving or high diving. So again, you know, it's just stepping it up just that little bit more and just expanding yourself out there to seeing what else is out there, you know, having a look at that bigger picture of life, but within yourself as well, you know, like we said from the start, like taking away from that complacency and that tunnel vision and just really opening your mind up to, to who you are and experiencing who you are. And, you know, that becomes, uh, you become more proud of who you are because you're yeah. overcoming these new challenges and testing yourself in, in new ways you never thought of really. So it's about presenting those things to, to the Australian audience. So know, how do we, that. how do we find out about this or uh, how would Australia learn about it or become part of it or find ways to support it or, or to join, join up on the day? Just to follow uh, Blue Knot Foundation on their social media um, you know, the P PR is really great with it. There'll be more that's coming up with it. We'll have a lot of uh, press that will go out about the event also. And uh, we'll, starting next year, we'll really start to make some noise about the whole thing and uh, really share people like, the shape of it and how they can join, not just in the event itself, but leading up to it. Like, it'll, you know, we're going to make it really interactive with people and uh, in just a fun, lighthearted way, but also obviously you know, as I said, you know, it's trauma informed of, of how you overcome yeah. it and just sharing that hope with people as, as we've spoken about, you know, a few times is, you know, just really giving people that hope and, and showing them 
what the other side looks like, you know, what, what that brighter future actually looks like, you know. Well, we'll definitely be sharing all that information. I'll get it through you and through the organization and make sure it's plugged all through um, this episode and, and all the platforms that we go to. And I for sure will be part of that. Um, I'll be back in Sydney by then, I'm sure. <laughs> so, um, all right, Damien, well, we've we've covered a lot of territory today and it's really profound your experience, your life experience and to watch what you've endured and, and overcome and continue to overcome and, and then just to take it to that next level where your entire dedication and commitment to use that to help people and just to spread awareness and, and give people hope and, and options is um, it's, it's truly inspiring. And I'm, I'm incredibly grateful for your time and your voice because your words are changing lives and they already have and they do now and they continue to. So um, it's, it's a really special episode to have you here and um, thanks for your time. Um, also, just how do we, how do people, I'll put everything up, but um, how do people find you um, with One Breath Meditation and um, some of the coaching and the mentoring you do? Is that, is that yeah. on Amazon? Yeah. Is that a personal yeah, so thing that you do? Uh, I've got books on, on Apple Books and Barnes and & Noble. So you okay. can just check that, put in my name in, in, the, in the books and they, they pop up. Um, or you can go to obmlearning.com and if you want to learn what one breath meditation is and my evolved form of breath work, meditation, yoga, fitness for adults, for kids and for in-flight as well. So there's all our guided meditations for all of those and mood music just to nice. help get you through the day sometimes. Um, there's a lot of free things on there. There's a lot of e-books and that as well. So jump on there. So that's OBM Learning. And then otherwise, just follow me, you know, Damien Ryder cool. on all the social medias. And uh, yeah, feel free to reach out. You know, I'm not saying people stop, you know, I'm going to pass you off to someone else. You know, I, I reply to every single person who messages me. And usually within, you know, two hours, three hours, you know, depending how many messages come in on the day. But usually I'm, I'm pretty fast at, at replying back and it's not a robot and it's no one from offshore doing my accounts for me it's it's me who's uh who's talking to you so um yeah always feel free to, to reach out totally impressive um thank you um all the best in queensland and um onwards and upwards uh -huh, exactly all right thank you and thanks for what you're doing as well for all your listeners <laughs>